take a minute and drink it in. James Jude Courtney and Nick Castle, guys! Hello. How are Hello. you doing, sir? How are we doing, fellas? Are we okay? Doing wonderful. So glad to be here. We love Manchester, you guys. Love Manchester. How about you, Nick? You doing okay? It's pretty good. It's no, I love it, too. <laughs> We've been escorted around by his lovely companion who went to school here. So we had, we had a first-hand guide. And, then, and the roots grow deep because her father's family is, they're Mancunians. So Manchester runs deep in our family, guys. And they're proper Mancunians. They're here, aren't they, I believe? Yeah, they're here. They're here, yeah. Give it up. Give it up for the Mancunians over here. So I'm from Liverpool, so that means nothing to me. Um, <laughs> you enjoy the UK. How do you find the UK fan base? Oh, UK fan base is awesome. You guys are so beautiful. And, and, and you're polite. Americans are not polite. You guys are polite. <laughs> How is it an American con to sign this? <laughs> to throw the money at you? Yeah, right. <laughs> um, we're here primarily to talk about Halloween, Halloween kills, Halloween ends, because you guys are the definitive Michael Myers, really, the original... And the modern day classic? Well, we a pimple, refer- a, a pink pimple over there. <laughs> we refer to it as the Alpha and the Omega. The al- I like that. I like that. So obviously you originated the character and you put the stamp on it and finished it. And obviously there's been a lot of people in between. What is it you think that keeps bringing people back to Michael Myers and makes people want to see that character on the screen? Well, I have to say, I think it starts with who created it. And, you know, uh, John Carpenter and Deborah Hill, the mastery of what they created, and then what this man so intuitively did. Um, so truly, in, in my portrayal of this character, I'm standing on the shoulder of a giant. So it made my job so much easier because Nick so intuitively created the character that you all know and love right now. But it really started with John Carpenter and Deborah Hill. Yeah. And you were there on set of the first movie playing Michael. How much, how much of the role did John let you do yourself? How much was on the page? Was it a combination of both? Yeah, it was a, you know, it, 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 he kind of just gave me the mask and said, walk here, walk there, tilt your head. So uh, the, head tilt, the head tilt was from oh, John? Yeah, no, yeah, that was from John. Ah. Yes, it was. Uh, you know, it's, um, so like uh, Jim is implying, it's kind of, it was whatever instinctually made me decide how to walk and, and uh, move. Uh, so, um, I guess from years of studying horror film. No, it was just on the day. Just on the day. On the day. I figured this it guy. out. This guy. I like that. Just, just wing it. Just fine. Yeah, wing. Just, just going to wing it and create a horror icon that's going to last for 45 years. It's unbelievable. Halloween was the first proper horror movie that I ever saw. Is that a case with you guys? A lot of you guys? Throw your hands up if Halloween was the movie that changed your life. Enough said, I think. Um, If you've got a question for these two absolute legends, throw your hands up in the air. We're going to be taking them right from the beginning. We're going to be mixing it into the conversation. And if you're from Scotland, could we please have an interpreter? We've got a Scottish interpreter. Aaron Aaron is about. He's he's our official Scottish interpreter. Um, Before we go to the Halloween questions, I am going to go straight to Nick Castle and say, you are responsible for two, well, apart from Michael Myers, two of my favourite things on this planet. Escape from New York, written by this man, one of the best films ever made, and the theme tune to Big Trouble in Little China, with John Carpenter and the Coupe de Ville's, this guy. So thank you so much, sir, for a big part of my life. Oh. Hello. Hello. Hello there. Um, this is a question for the both of you. Hello. Um, Michael Myers is such an iconic character. How do you think a character becomes so pivotal and like the face of horror? So recently we've had Art the Clown and Sam from Trick or Treat, but Michael Myers is one that stands out so iconically. What do you think it is about that character that just makes him so incredible? Um, Well, one thing is the mask. You know, I mean, just technically speaking, uh, when I think that enigmatic blank expression lets the audience kind of read in who that is. There's a lot of you young women that have a crush on him, which I'm a little concerned about. 
but I think that had something to do with it. He was just kind of like this blank slate that you can uh, kind of fill in. Uh, so I think that, ha you know, he's not as specific as a lot of the other characters. I mean, I guess you could say that of Jason, too, but that human-looking oddball blankness, I think, was very clever. And, of course, we all know how that came about. Tommy Lee Wallace, the production designer, went to a uh, toy store, grabbed a William Shatner mask, and doctored it up, and that's what we got. And I think to add to that, you know, who hasn't had a dream where you're running and you can't get away? You just feel that thing drawing you from behind. So the concept of, a, of, a, of, a, uh, of an evil entity who can walk faster than you can run, you just can't get away. And so I think it, it takes us back to the id, to the subconscious. You know, that so deep inside of us, we all have this, this, this preternatural fear of, of you know, of, of being in a place that we can't control, that we can't defend ourselves in, and we can't get away. So I think that the genius of what, what John Carpenter created, what Nick so naturally fell into, because, you know, when I, when I was called to, to do this, um, to play this character, um, there's a great old character actor named Ted Knight who gave me an incredible gift. He, um, he told me, if you want to be a good actor, you know, emulate, learn to emulate, emulate the bartender, emulate the guy walking down the street, emulate your mom or your dad, but don't try to talk like them or move like them, just reach inside their soul and grab their soul, and if you grab their soul, you will naturally do what they do. So I watched the 20, I mean, 1978 version one time, and there's a scene where Nick is walking camera left to camera right in a backyard, and I went, I got it. I reached inside what Nick had created, what John Carpenter, Deborah Hill so brilliantly had, had, had brought into you know, existence, um, and I captured what Nick created, and that thing that Nick did so naturally is the essence of what I was afraid of in my own dreams. It's a deep answer. <laughs> <laughs> I like yours, just, just walk, it's fine. Well, you want it. <laughs> You wanted an answer, so there you, <laughs> you go. got an answer. No, maybe so not. many people are going to want questions. There's one more over there. Hello. Hi. Um, I was obviously both of you made like completely. You hold the microphone up a little bit higher. I'm so sorry. So, Nick, you started all of this Michael Myers, and then obviously James, you ended it with both of you playing completely different eras of Michael Myers. How did your experiences differ from that of each other? Well, you know, you got to imagine, <clears throat> for me, there was no Halloween movie when we started. There was no franchise. There was no sense of it being this amazing success. So all it was was a little movie that John was doing, my good friend from film school. And so it was a lark. It was like doing <clears throat> a film project with a bigger camera. So it was kind of offhanded for someone like... Uh, James or even some of the other guys that did it afterwards. It's a totally different experience because you have the weight of the franchise now and the weight of the, of, uh, uh, the success of the movie. Uh, so it's a different ball of wax. Well, I, I think for, you know, for me, um, um, my father was Special Forces and, and my brothers and I sort of learned his mentality that once you're given a mission, once you have a focus, you, you commit 100% to that focus and nothing else exists. You wear blinders. So truly, when I said standing on the shoulder of a giant, you know, standing on Nick's shoulders um, gave me this immense gift and the, and, the, and the heritage of Halloween, that, you know, especially 1978, um, because I was informed immediately that none of the other movies mattered. In our universe, it goes 1978, 2018, Halloween kills, Halloween ends. So really, I had the benefit of what Nick had created so naturally, and I allowed that to, you know, inculcate my being and allowed that to be filtered through my 60-some-odd years of life and experience as an actor, as a stuntman, as an athlete, um, you know, and all these, you know, all, all, the, all the work I did as an actor um, built up. I like, you know, playing characters like the Kinderstode and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So there was no pressure it was really the gift of walking into to a, a painting that had been half painted already. Um, so it was, it was really, it was a really, it was a super, super joy. And hands down, man, the, um, the, the gift of a lifetime to play this character. 
I, I personally think your iteration of Michael is, I'm, I'm sorry, James. James's version of Michael is becoming the defin definitive look of the character. Obviously, it's it's in sync with your version. The costumes the same, the masks the same. It does feel like there's the connective tissue between you guys, and I think that's why that 2018 film especially resonated so well with it. it was such a strong movie. Um, making that movie, what were you told going into it? Obviously, David Gordon Green and Danny McBride with the creative team behind it. John was doing the music. It felt like sort of getting the band back together, getting yourself involved. Um, what was that process like? You handing over, because you, you were in the film, you did some voice work for Michael, and then you take over, put the mask on, and it's fucking game time. So what was it, what would, talk us through making 2018 and obviously where you guys became friends. Well, you know, by the time I came on the set, James had already started the show. And so the relationship there was between James and David and how to play the role. <clears throat> Once I got there, we, we became very quickly close friends. And we still are. Aww. We just went to Edinburgh together with our lovely ladies. And, um, and, and still have a, a, a great time together. But as far as the show was concerned, there was a passing of the torch, so to speak. James could talk more about it, but it was in one scene where I was on camera for the only time. And then, as you mentioned, in the, the post-production of all the movies that David did, I did the breathing. So I'm gonna give you some free breathing right now. <sighs> that's... that's the original castle Halloween brief. Hence Nick's castle's brilliance. <laughs> yeah, so I think it was about three weeks in um, when, when Nick showed up. Uh, David didn't really direct me character-wise. I showed up prepared. That's our job, right? Our job is to show up prepared. And I think the movie industry is really unique this way. It's one of the very few industries where you can hire 130 or 180 people and everybody shows up knowing how to do their job. There's no training that happens on, on the day, on the, on the set. So I show up prepared. The, David, the direction David gave me one day, well, he called me after I was cast and said, okay, James, um, so uh, uh, Jimmy, he, uh, he calls me Jimmy, um, I, wa I want you to move like a cat. And I said, well, that's kind of crazy because my cat Parsifal is sitting on my lap. He goes, okay, good enough. So anyways, um, uh, when you come down, let's, uh, let's have dinner. And, and that's, that's the only conversation we ever had about the character. Um, Nick and I have never talked about the character, never. We've talked about a million things, especially his films. And if you haven't seen the Nick Castle film yet, do yourself a favor. He's made some of the most beautiful films ever, ever made in, in our history. So please ex do, do a Nick Castle um, retrospective at some point. Um, so I want to jump in a little second. Correct me if I'm wrong, Nick. You, you've directed so many, so many different films. You made Dennis. Yes, Dennis. Dennis the Menace. Everyone remembers Dennis the Menace from the 90s, Mr. Wilson. Nick Castle directed Walter Matthau as Mr. Wilson. James Jude Courtney's correct. This guy is a true artist. My favorite film of Nick, well, I have two. Uh, well, actually, my favorite film that Nick made was, is called Tap. Um, and if anybody loves dance, especially tap dancing in the iconic, you know, the, it, it, please, please do yourself a favor and see that film. So when Nick got there, we didn't know how we were going to share the screen or how, what, we, and what we were hoping, both of us, is that we were going to have a passing of the torch. And sure enough, David set it up so that when Laurie Strode is driving up in front of the house and you see the shape up in the window, that's Nick. So when she shoots the weapon and you see the, the shape's face mask in the mirror, um, that's me. And the fun part was um, the weapon, the, the rifle was about two feet behind me and a foot over and they shot the projectile right past my head into the mirror and Nick was going, well, I'm glad you did it to you because I wasn't gonna do that shit. So we had the proverbial passing of the torch, and, and it really was a, a very, very special moment. And, um, and, and so that whole thing, we leave everything else to conjecture of what that means to, to the fans. I think it's a perfect moment. I think you guys are my two favorite Michaels. No disrespect to anyone else. I love them all. The OG, the new guy. It's, it's the Alpha and the Omega. I love it. And you've probably done more Halloween 
films than anyone else? As That's correct. Uh, yeah, I'm the only one who's done three. You've done three, and more screen time than anyone else, I suppose? Uh, Tyler Maine did two. Um, God, I can't remember. You're, yeah. Ta yeah, but like that's Rob Zombies. That doesn't count. This is <laughs> I'm, no, no disrespect to Rob. No, no. Don't cause beef with me and Tyler Mayne. He'll stamp my head in. Um, he's a big dude. No, like for me, it's the the Carpenter, the original, and then the new ones. Um, the response to David Gordon Green's trilogy has been mixed in terms of what it means for the character. The actual films themselves, I think, are fantastic. I think the performances are great. I love the way the story went. And I love that it was definitive and it had closure. Did he have a plan going into the beginning? Were you aware of the plan? And how, how did that affect your performance? Well, let me, let me put it this way. You know, because the controversial film is Halloween Ends, right? Oftentimes on set, David Gordon Green would wear a Season of the Witch t-shirt. He knew exactly what he's doing. And so the end, the Halloween Ends being controversial, is what David Gordon Green intended. He intended for it to be what Season of the Witch is now. It wasn't well received by some in, 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 in its day, and now it's become a cult classic. And David knows that as time goes by, Halloween Ends is going to become a cult classic. Um, I'm often asked, you know, how I feel about Halloween Ends. Um, I played football, American football, and in and, 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 and team sports, in football for instance, the number one thing an athlete does is buy into the coach's program. You've got to buy into the coach's program. If you can't buy into his program, get off the field, go find another coach, go find another team. And I think it's with every team sport. It's a team sport making a movie. My job was to buy into the coach's program, to buy into David's program, and to give that everything I had. Do I want to be in every scene? Heck yeah. Do I want to play every play as an athlete? Heck yeah. But it was my job to fulfill David's vision. And I love David Gordon Green. He's you know, I've worked with Ron Howard and Louis Mandoki and Francis Ford Coppola, like really amazing directors. David Gordon Green, hands down, is the best director I've ever worked with. And I'm hoping to work with this man, Nick Castle, one day, because then he'll be my favorite director to work with. And how was your experience on the new trilogy? Because you played the flasher in Halloween Ends. Oh, yes. Yeah, I did. <clears throat> I... Uh, Early on in the two, before the 2018, I'd talked to David about how I wanted to participate, you know, and how much I wanted to do. And we quickly decided that a cameo was the best thing for an old man as myself. We needed a spry young, ten year younger person to actually fulfill the role and actually do the work. Boy, am I glad I never got involved with that part of it, because this man is not only a great actor. But he's a really good stuntman, too, and he can take a punch. He can take a chair, even when the crazy actors that don't know what they're doing are throwing it at you. So um, in that respect, yeah, I, I mean, I was, it was always, um, I was always part of the, you know, part of the family. They treated me so well on the set. It was like I was an, the icon that I am. They, uh, they actually uh, treated me as such on, on the set. That was, that was a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, I got to be part of the party, you know, that was this new Halloween. And, of course, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I think since that, I mean, whether you love the films or not, it gave a boost to the whole franchise. It gave a boost to all the love that you guys have for the, for the movie, even if it's just going back and realizing how great the first one was. You know, so um, it was a wonderful thing for the... Uh, for myself, and I think the whole family of people that have done the, done the character, uh, just because it's so much more interest in, in the franchise, and it's all because of you guys. Yeah. You got a question right at the back. Hello. Um, so Nick, you've already kind of answered my question, so I'll ask James, I guess. Um, how does it make you feel that there are, yeah, there are girls who have a crush on Michael Myers? Well, wait, say that again. Sorry, I couldn't hear Oh, I'm it. so sorry. Um, how does it make you feel that you know, there are people out there that have a crush on Michael Myers? Oh, you, why don't you say it again to him? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't quite hear that. Um, it's, it's, I think it's really beautiful. It's, what, the way I describe this experience with you guys is it's like little drops of love all day long. And I think it's, it's you know, it's, when, when human beings get to share a passion, um, it's a really 
beautiful, beautiful, miraculous thing. And you know, you look over this, this swath of humanity here, socioeconomics, race, religion, sexual orientation, all these things that allegedly divide us as human beings do not exist in this room. Every one of us, that, you know, Nick and I and, and, and Don Shanks and, you know, uh, Tom Orgo, you know, the people that we get to meet, you guys, we get to share a passion together. We get to share these moments of love and, 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 and joy. And so that's what I find really moving. And sometimes I move to tears. And sometimes I move to tears about the, the stories they tell, you guys tell us about how these films have affected you or what it meant to you or... Maybe sometimes, and I hear this a lot, of people are going through, you know, particularly the hard times. Um, and how, you know, going to see one of these Halloween films has cheered them up. Or they heard, you know, a comment or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, there, there, there are the DMs with uh, women asking me to wear the mask and do unmentionable things. But um, uh, my future wife will tell you, ain't gonna happen. Just before we go on to the next question, we had Scout Taylor Compton and Daniel Harris last year. Someone in the crowd brought that up. Um, they make their boyfriend wear a Michael Myers mask. Not a joke. Next no. question. Hiya. <laughs> I grew up on horror films, so it's amazing to see you. My mum brought me up on horror films. I just wanted to know, especially Nick Castle, um, what, what do you feel about how Halloween has continued? Like, there's video games with Michael Myers in now. Did you expect it to go as big as it is now? Uh, I, I, the question is, did I expect how the Michael Myers would roll out into all these different media? Yeah. That kind of thing. Well, you know, it not, not, I, I guess you could look back and say, it, it wasn't, uh, uh, you shouldn't be surprised because... Anything that makes money, people try to, to have, make more money with. And uh, sometimes it turns out to be good, sometimes it turns out to be annoying, sometimes, sometimes bad. So, um, it, you, you know, you're, you're left with um, <clears throat> the creator of the new medium coming up with something that is exceptional. And you hope that it's going to be good to honor the franchise in the way it should be honored. So, I know John is always happy when someone does something else and he gets more money. <laughs> that's, his, <laughs> that's how he weighs how these things go and how successful they are. So, uh, and I enjoy, it's amazing how thing, you wind up finding Michael someplace else, you know, in, the, in another world that you, know, uh, that you would never expect it to be. I mean, just the idea that internationally he's known as a character. Someone just came up with a Taiwanese uh, one sheet of the movie's uh, poster. And I went, Where? I didn't recognize those, na those letters. So you can see he's all over the world. How, how do you, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it back to John Carpenter. How is your relationship with John? Do you still keep in touch? Are you still friends? Because you guys were in a band together. Yeah, John, <clears throat> John and I went to film school back in the late 60s, way back. Um, and uh, did some movies together in film school and stayed friends all along. So, uh, yeah, I just saw him about a month ago. Whenever I go, well, not whenever I go, because I've been going too many, so many, <laughs> too many. That's a Freudian slip. So many con conventions this year. When I come back with a whole stack of money, I call John and said, John, I owe you another free lunch. <laughs> and we do. We go out to lunch, and he's always good for a free, free lunch, believe me. If you call him up tomorrow, I'll pay for your lunch. He'll be there. Do you ever want to play music with him again? Because I know he tours occasionally. Is he, is do you, do you, would you want to play music with him again? Oh, yeah. It would be fun if I, my voice would ever come back. You know, Aww. somehow it's... Uh, you hear it's graveling just from talking to you guys. I need a voice coach very quickly if uh, we were ever to get together again. There was talk about one time about the Coupe de Ville's doing like a one night concert, but uh, don't hold your breath. I'd have to max me credit cards to fly to wherever that is. The Big Trouble in Little China theme goes on in my house about once a week. Like, I'll be in the kitchen, it's Big Trouble in Little China. Um, Tim, we got any more questions? There we go. And John O'Keefe over there's got a question as well. Big Michael Myers fan. Look at the big dude there, just posing, flexing. He's next. Hi. Hello. Uh, this is a question for both of you. Um, 
I've not heard a mention of, well, one mention, but no questions about um, Jamie Lee Curtis. You know, um, what was that like uh, working with her as a scene partner, um, of course? Kind of one of the original, the original final girls. So, um, you know, what was it like to, to act with her? Oh, that, that, <coughs> that's interesting because, you know, they, J Jamie and Jim really had a, a long, stronger and longer relationship because of the three movies, because of all the, you know, fisticuffs that they went through. Uh, so th th that was really special. Um, for me, it was Jamie's first movie, you know, and uh, she was just, uh, you know, a young woman, a teenager, uh, who was just uh, really dedicated to, to doing the, the work well. Very real sweetheart. And so it was like, you know, meeting a new friend on the set. Uh, and she didn't have, obviously, again, it's kind of like all the baggage of Jamie Lee Curtis coming on the set. When I saw her again on 2018, uh, it was fun. I got on the set, and of course, this is 40 years later, you know, or so. And she saw me across the lot where we were shooting the movie and saw me and she just went, Castle! And we ran towards each other, gave ourselves a big hug, and she said, is this nuts or what? So that's the kind of relationship we had in the new movies. So, you know, obviously I walk in and knowing Jamie's, um, her filmography and the, you know, the body of tremendous work she's done, but not knowing her as a person, um, I characterize Jamie Lee Curtis as a poster child for an empowered woman. Um, she, I was raised by a powerful woman. I have a deep appreciation for powerful women. And Jamie Lee Curtis is the epitome of a self-realized, you know, a woman. She's self-deprecating. She's funny as hell. She's incredibly intelligent. She does not suffer fools gladly. Um, and so, and the first one in 2018, um, she walked over and introduced herself. But then I stepped back. I, I stayed away from her because I didn't know her process as an actor. I didn't know, you know, think about it. I mean, she has a much more complex character to play in that she has these conflicting motions going on. I mean, with, with my character and then her alcoholism and her, you know, family problems and all these things she's dealing with. So I pretty much left her to her, to her own devices. And then in the ending that we shot that didn't end up in 2018, we were going to do a big fight scene. And um, so... Finally, she was at the other end of the hair, tra hair and makeup trailer, and she storms down to the end. She goes, okay, let's talk about this fucking fight scene. And I, we started talking about it, and so we did the fight. We started working out the fight scene. I don't pad up when I fight because I like to feel. Like if I'm getting hit in the ribs, or, you know, I, the only way I, I wear pads are my elbows and my knees. And if I'm getting hit in the back with a baseball bat, which I do often, I'll wear a spine pad, a very, very thin spine pad. But I want to feel it. Well, we were doing the, working out the fight scene and the stunt coordinator wanted to pad her up. She absolutely refused. That woman has a body that's hard as a rock and she fights like a guy. She throws frickin' down, man. And so we, you know, we went through that process, we, we did the fight. So then, you know, and, and Halloween Kills, I never saw her. And, you know, then we, and, and so, you know, she called me up and we talk. And a one-hour conversation with Jamie is like this. 55 minutes Jamie, five minutes me. And, and so then we get to Halloween Ends, and, you know, we, and, and by that time we know each other. We know each other well. So, you know, we, we sit down and have a cup of coffee together. We have a conversation together. And then it comes to the finale. And as we're getting ready to shoot the finale, um, I called her over and said, Jamie, let's, let's talk about this. And she goes, yeah, let's go beat by beat. So we walk off to the side and we start talking about each beat that we're going to go through in our, in our final scene together. And as that happens, we, it actually gets me right now, we have tears rolling down our cheeks because we know these two characters are so deeply in love and there's so much antipathy, and, there's, and, and, and like there's, there's so much pathology. There's, um, there's, we, there's, and, a, and as we go through this process, you know, she's doing her own fighting. That's her head that I punched through the glass. You know, that's, I mean, her, she was bruised from shoulder to knees. I was bruised from shoulders to knees. Because that was days and days and days of fighting. And at one point, 
I'm laying on the table and they're putting prosthetics on my neck, resetting lights, so I had to lay and I couldn't move. I had to remain very still. So she walks up and she grabs my hand, closes her eyes, and for an hour we stood there and just held hands, just like two lovers would. And in the end, we've, she and I have talked about this, as we're fighting through those, those, those final scenes, we were both feeling these amazingly intense emotions of love and hate, wanting to die, wanting to kill, and all the weird things that will happen with real human beings and real experience. So as a scene partner, um, Jamie and I t talked about this. We both agreed that that finale is the most, the most rich and deep scene that she or I have ever done in a movie. And, and so I look back at this as like, how do you top that? How do you top that? And that woman... Um, I mean, I, there aren't enough superlatives for me to, 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 to describe what working with that woman has meant to me. We've got just a couple of minutes left, so this is going to be our last question there from John. A uh, question for Nick and James. Obviously, we've seen the news that Halloween will be coming back. I just wanted to know where you'd like to see it going next. Would you like to see Michael Myers come back straight away in a reboot or... TV series with Dr. Loomis or like a young Michael Myers TV series, where would you both like to see it go from here? Well, um, you know, I really don't have an opinion so much as I hope it, it lands with someone with a lot of creativity uh, that has at least uh, as much of a, of a, is as much of a fan in their love of the franchise as David had for his tr trilogy. So that's what you hope for, is that it, it not maybe, the, maybe not the way you would have done it, but you want someone that, in, that really uh, respects the, the property and wants to make it well, whether it's TV or a, a great video game or, or another movie. Of course, I, I hope it uh, lives in the world of movies again because I just love that medium so much. I hear this next idea might be a series, so I'm just very curious about how they're going to do it. That's it. I have to say, um, Malik Akkad is, has become a very good friend, and Malik jealously guards this franchise because, as you all know, his father was tragically murdered in a terrorist attack. Um, so, you know, there will never be a Freddy versus Michael or a Jason versus Michael. There, he will never dilute the, the process. So I'm trusting that what Malik is, is endeavoring with this, this new television series um, is going to explore some other dimension, some other universe, um, ideally, like Nick said, in, in the vein of quality that will take us to a whole other place, give us a whole much, a much deeper maybe understanding of, of the, the, the pathos of this character. Um, but I'm also with Nick. I think, I think this, this franchise is best lived on a big screen. It's meant for the cinema. Um, so I, I'm, I'm in hopes that as they do this, explore this universe, it's a three-year deal they have with Miramax. It's Trancus and Miramax. Blumhouse is not involved. Um, I'm in hopes that what they do with it will give us a little pearls of joy, and then in the future they can bring it back and, and you know, explore more of Michael in some other dimension. Um, I doubt that I'll ever be back unless they add another zero to my paycheck. Um, I am, after all, a whore. <laughs> I think that might be the perfect way to end it. Please give it up for the Alpha, the Omega, Mr. Nick Castle, and Mr. James Jude Courtney!